Hi, my name is Morgan Brannon. I am a licensed speech language pathologist currently working in the school system. And today I wanted to go over some different um, strategies and techniques that can help facilitate um, communication in the classroom in the general ed setting or in the special education setting with your children that use or have complex communication needs. Um, the first thing I always want to think about when I'm trying to grow communication with a student who maybe uses an alternative method of communicating, like a device, or relies heavily on nonverbal um, forms of communication, like pointing or crying or whining or facial expressions um, that leave a lot for the listener to interpret, is my, one of my favorite quotes that behavior is communication and communication is behavior. Um, so we know sometimes what a student needs or what they like or what they don't like, even if they do not have a verbal or have a clear cut um, form of communication, just simply based on their routine, the context, their facial expressions, their grimaces or their little whines or the smallest little head tilt. If you spend enough time or you've been around um, your students, even for a short period of time, it's clear to know what they like and what they don't like. And when we are trying to help a student communicate in a new way, we wanna think about those inferences and how we know what we know. Um, so that's always a great place to start. So if I know that my student in the morning really likes to listen to a certain type of music um, and I know that because they smile really big or maybe they can push themselves over to that direction or they grunt or maybe they just look over there um, or maybe I'm not even 100% sure they like it but that is what we do every morning so they kind of know that routine. I'm going to start there or start with that interaction or context and think about how I can grow that or if there's any words I can give them to help them gain control of that context or gain control of that routine and start expressing preferences or comments or um, interacting with people um, in, a, in a familiar way but with new vocabulary. Here is a quick example of one of those inferences that you may make daily and about a student's preferences and a way that you can start using that inference to grow their communication, either using their communication device or a sign or any mode of communication you think might be accessible to them. So the first is you want to figure out and identify how you know what the student likes or doesn't like or how you know the information you, if you had to fill out a like and dislike sheet, how do you know that? So maybe with this student, they come in at 12 p.m., they always listen to music, um, the teacher takes them over to the music station and they start grinning and they make a vocalization and you can just tell all over their body that they're anticipating what's coming next. They know when you put the headphones on, they're getting very excited. So you can infer that they like music time not because they said, oh, thank you so much, or I would like music, I want music. Simply based on their body cues, you know that they really like this and then this is a highly valued um, activity. So this might be a good place to start and allow them to expand upon, upon that interaction and you have great motivation because you already know they like it. So I could expand on this by maybe walking over and joining them. And before turning on the music, maybe I point to a low tech board that says go and stop and I point to go. And then I start the music and I sit there for a couple minutes. And after they really enjoyed it, I hit stop. Or maybe if I know they like five different songs, I can on a low tech option, print out five different screenshots of those songs. Um, or maybe I can even play five little clips of those songs on a go talk and they can make a choice about which song they want by pressing it. And it doesn't matter which they pick because I know those are all preferred. So they're, they're gonna um, be able to make a preference choice with error-free learning, nothing's gonna be wrong. I don't need them to select, uh, like go to play the music or stop the stop the music. They're simply making a choice. Um, so, or I could also grab 
if they had a high tech system, same thing. I could make a music board and start with just a couple selections and grow up from there. Um, some other great ways that are just kind of cause and effect things are, like I said earlier, stop and go. So priming them with, I'm going to make the music go. And then if you get to a clear point, stop and wait and listen, wait, observe, and see if maybe they can tell you to go again. Um, maybe I'm going to turn down the volume real low when I start the music and see if they notice. And how are they going to communicate to me that it's not working? Because they will, you'll be surprised at how creative and how much good problem solving you can do just by doing those slight tweaks to the routine. Maybe you realize that they make a facial grimace and they make great eye contact. And you can use that eye contact to say, oh, you want it up, up, up. Let's turn that music up and immediately reward that engagement and that communication exchange with showing them how they can verbalize what they want, what they're already thinking. So those, that task is, goes into a great, um, when I think about growing communication, there are a lot of things to consider with picking the task or picking the method of communication. But one of the biggest things to consider is how the arousal and the excitement or the motivation of the activity itself, and then how difficult is the task that you're asking them to perform. So if we go back to the music task and we we know that for this student, maybe they have um, physical limitations that keep them from being able. So the task is hard. If they have to hit a switch or exert physical energy to hit a switch, that's going to be difficult for them. So it's a difficult task. So I want to make sure that they're calmed down before I ask them to do it. I don't want to do it in the middle of their excitement and overjoy, maybe I let them get into the activity. And then once they're in the routine of the activity, I start asking them to say, go or stop. You want to consider if a student, like our students on the spectrum, they are already at such a generally high arousal. And, and it can go either way. I understand that some of our children also could be under aroused or under stimulated. If you have a student who is stays in a constant state of um, movement and alert alertness, I don't even think that's a word, um, but you will want to consider that when they are excited or really into activity, you want to make sure that communication is easy and clear. So maybe then it, you're only going to use the word more or help or stop, and you're going to make it quick easy so that they can get right back into the activity, but they also see the value of the communication. So I just thought this was a good chart to kind of show you that you have to factor in how hard is the task for the child, but also what is their energy level at that moment and what's their access level like and is it going to be motivating without being over motivating or is it going to be too difficult that doesn't allow them um, the opportunity to succeed. So there's just a lot of things to consider when picking an activity, but it's still possible to find activities and small moments to grow those communications based on your children's behaviors, their preferences, the things they like, your classroom routine. There's always room to grow communication just that one step more. The first strategy I wanted to go over is one that I think as educators were very clear with, and we understand the value of teaching and modeling and showing by doing, um, or teaching by doing, but it's hard to think of that and transfer that no knowledge to a communication device. When you talk about modeling, you, you don't want your student to be the only person in the room communicating in whatever method they have available to them. If they're communicating using Proloquo, you want to make sure that you are acting as a model of someone who communicates in a certain way with Proliquo um, or SnapCore or a low-tech device or even a switch. You want to make sure you show them exactly how to do that. Um, and that can be using their communication system. So if they're in a small group, um, using their device when you're speaking, and it doesn't have to be every single word, but using what level of vocabulary you think they can understand 
or what level you think they are at and maybe going just a little bit above that. So scaffolding to the next level. So if my students at the one word level where they're able to use their device to ask for more or to stop, I might make a sentence when I'm modeling. I want stop or I want go or I want help. And I would only ask them to communicate using one word. Um, but you want to touch the device, you want to use the device, you want to encourage peers to touch the device. A lot of times I will go into classrooms and the teacher will have made rules that this is Johnny's device and we don't want to talk, touch it because this is the way he talks and, and almost get the kids fearful. And I get that too because you don't want small children running off with an exp expensive communication device. But at the same time, if other kids are interested and peers are interested in the device, it's only going to grow the student's interest. So if you can get a peer to sit down with you and hunt for those, can you match this Go picture with the Go picture on Johnny's talker? Let's all say Go, 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 Go. And just by touching the device or even just looking at it with you, almost like when you're sharing a story together, the communication device can become something interesting and exciting for all the students and not just the student who really needs it. Um, so having peers model or um, use the device, or even if you um, want to print out a screenshot of the first of the, the core words scene or the core words on your student's communication device so that you're able to model with them without having to touch the communication device or you know, maybe you're in a group setting and there's too many devices um, to be able to model everything perfectly. Maybe you just have a core board set somewhere apart that you're able to kind of model and show the kids how you can make sequences or how touching the words gets you what you want. Um, though all, this is one of the most powerful things you can, you can do as an educator, educator or encourage parents to do um, at home, especially that this is just as valuable for them to use as their student to use. Um, and I know a lot of people get nervous because they don't know where the vocabulary is or know how to find the vocabulary, but only by using the device and you figuring it out, are you gonna be able to teach your student how to do the same? So if it takes you a little bit longer or you are getting nervous because you're not sure if that button's on there, it's okay to problem solve in front of our students. They don't. They don't, they don't hold you to a perfect standard. The next strategy I wanted to touch on briefly is called wait time. And um, wait time, I think might be something if you've worked in education, you're also familiar with, but a good rule of thumb is when you think you've waited long enough, count to five. So when you pose a question like, what did you do last night? Or would you like some more Play-Doh? Don't just keep asking. Don't say, would you like some more Play-Doh? Let's get more Play-Doh, more Play-Doh. I want more Play-Doh. You want more Play-Doh too. Come on, press right here, more, more, more. Um, which is a trap we can get into when our students aren't communicating back and forth with us in a reciprocal manner. You, t you tend to fill the silent gaps. So you want to talk more and do more and do more of the communication work for your student, but silence is can be very valuable, especially for our students with complex communication needs. Language is so difficult that sometimes they need more time to process. Process the question, process, process the movement, think about what you're asking of them. And if you just keep adding more and more language or more and more demands, it can quickly get overwhelming. And then you're not sure if they didn't understand the first question you asked or the 15th question you asked. So staying silent. If they abandon the task or um, if they look disinterested, that might be a good cue to try something again or phrase it a little differently or give them a cue. Um, but if they're there and engaged and just sitting, don't feel like you have to add to that. Um, and then sometimes keeping track of how long a student takes to activate or how long a student takes to make a choice or respond using their mode of communication can be helpful data wise because if you have a student you know that started out needing 20 to 30 seconds of 
silence or queuing before they were able to make a choice. And then by next progress note, you were able to get it down to 15 seconds in structured tasks and things like that. It's just great data, anecdotal data that you can tell parents like, remember they used to take so long and we'd have to wait and wait and they really cut that down. They know what's expected of them. Um, they know how to get to what they need to. It's just a great indicator of um, progress too. And I like to keep track of that just so I know if they wait a little bit longer on new vocabulary or they wait a little bit longer, maybe they're confused. Um, but if they seem to generally need 10 to 15 seconds, that's helpful information, not only for you, but for the parents, for any other teachers working with them, like, hey, you gotta give them 10 to 15 seconds, maybe even 20 seconds before you ask them another question. Um, don't rush them, they are listening, those kind of things. Um, you only know when you explore wait time and you stay quiet, which is a particularly hard for me and something I'm still working on. The next strategy is recasting and expanding. Recasting is uh, where you grow your students' utterances just to that next level. Um, so when we talked about the student who wanted to listen to music and we knew she liked music because she got really excited when we took her over to the music station in the classroom. She started laughing and giggling and all of those things. So she already has a fantastic method of communicating that she likes music, right? Some of her kids don't give you even that amount of reaction, but it's clear she's communicating and expressing non-verbally that she really likes music. So how can I grow that? Well, maybe I can get her to say go before we go over to music or maybe she can initiate and I can give her a button that says music and she can, then she could get it throughout the day or whenever she wanted and have a little bit more control over her environment, which is huge when you don't have motor control um, or so many of the things are done for the, our students, especially our students with more um, motor issues or other complex needs on top of communication. Giving them some ability to control their environment is huge. Um, so giving her one word that maybe she can say, or giving her an ability to select which music, which song she would like to play first. Those are all just growing at that next step. And then when you have a student who maybe is starting to communicate at the one word level by using their good core vocabulary, which I will touch a little bit more on at the end, by saying want when they, and putting their hand out, and you as the listener are using context to know they want that Play-Doh that's sitting across for them, or want, they want that squishy toy that I have sitting out on the table. Um, then you can, once they're consistently asking for want, now I have, now let's get specific. Want Play-Doh. And I ha will have been modeling for a long time, even when they are just on the one word level, I want Play-Doh. I might be modeling at the three, uh, word level so that by the time I get to placing the to want Play-Doh demand on them, they've seen it done a whole bunch of times and I can scaffold them to that next level and cue them either with a tactile prompt or hand over hand at first to grow that expression next. And then slowly from there, we can get the I in there. I want more Play-Doh. And all I'm thinking about is how do I reward and let them know, yes, what you did was correct, or no, I think you could do something more or change it to solve your problem. So with my student who likes music, I'm immediately, when she hits music, I'm gonna take her over to the music and we're gonna play it and immediately reward that. And once she's hit music enough times, I'm gonna wheel her over and then I'm gonna say, but what should we play? And then that's gonna be the next step is making a choice after I've told you I want music before I get music. And then when she picks the song, I'm gonna play that song over and over. And then I'm gonna let her make another choice. And I'm just growing it, how much she's communicating in that one context. I'm growing how often she gets to communicate. Whereas my student who likes Play-Doh or is picking a preference thing, maybe he says, want Play-Doh. And after a couple times of want Play-Doh, that's not gonna get him Play-Doh anymore. I want Play-Doh. And what you might see, and what I even saw with one of my students this morning, is they'll problem solve and you'll see what words are they familiar with, what words do they kind of know as units. So my one student today wanted something open. He wanted 
the squishy toy out of the container I had it in. So he looked at me and said, open, open. That didn't work. He said, squishy, open. And I was getting him to wait. And then he said, close, closed, closed. And he had learned open and closed together. So he was problem solving as to what words do I need to say to get what I want. And those are the kind of things that are just helpful to see. Um, and then I can redirect him to, yes, you're right, it is closed, it's waiting. And I get to reinforce that word instead of reinforcing um, every time with exactly what he wanted. I could reinforce closed, that he was making a comment that it was closed and move on back to the activity I want to wanted him to be focusing on. So the next thing to consider um, is different areas of communication and how, how what you're doing in the classroom is targeting a specific area or maybe it's easier or helpful to target a different area. And this down here, the dynamic AAC goals grid, which I will bring over to show you. This is a um, put out by Toby Dynavox, and it is just a one free um, great continu continuum of ability level that helps with clear cut examples of what your student might be doing and what would be the next level to grow from that. So if I am dealing with an emergent communicator, they have limited to no understanding of symbols and pictures or represented by ideas. So that would be your student who is smiling and laughing to go get music, but they have no, if you held up a picture of music or a cow, they wouldn't be able to grab music because that's the one they want. Um, they're mainly only responding with, um, you know, nonverbals or things like that. But the next level is they're responding with common gestures. Um, and that might even be common gestures or common symbols that we can use on our communication device. But if you have a student who, you know, waves by when they don't like something because they would like to leave or they don't want to do that anymore and you know if they start waving they're trying to leave the environment that would be the next level they, they know there's something they have to do to communicate even if it's not you know necessarily the the most logical way that we would do it as verbal communicators so overall this is i mean it goes through even different ways to grow literacy strategies and then if you scroll down once you've kind of picked where your student is, you can, it puts good examples of goals um, and how, how you can word those for IEPs and you can slightly just tweak them to make them objectives or IEP goals. Um, and even put in there, they are currently at the emergent level of communication um, with scaffolds and supports, they have demonstrated an ability to uh, get to the level of emergent transitional. They are currently doing this versus last year they were doing that. This is a great um, piece of informal or even formal observation that you can include on a present level of education or in a progress note to mark progress um, for your students. And I know that sometimes can be hard when your student is has such a limited set of skills to see progress. This is a great thing to to show clear progress from one point to the next. Down here too, I just wanna point out is, and I'll go over briefly next, is the chain of cues prompting hierarchy. So let me get back into my slideshow and I can show you a little bit more of the exact hierarchy and what that kind of looks like. So when we talk about cues, this is something really important to keep in mind, is you, if you're dealing with a student who has complex communication needs, you are doing a ton of cueing. You are, it's not like our students um, who might be sitting in your regular ed classroom where you have to ask them a question and it, they either get it right or wrong. When you are dealing with complex communicators, you are constantly trying to guide them to the way or make things more difficult or less difficult to help them achieve communication. So the first thing is, if we're taking a student greeting other students, this is again pulled right off the Toby Dynavox that um, DAG's worksheet I just shared. 
The situation itself is a cue. So just entering a room is a routine. When you when you are in school entering, you know, maybe the lunchroom, everyone greets you, but maybe when you go into your classroom, you don't necessarily get greeted every time. So depending on where the student is in the building can be a cue, a situation or a contextual cue. Natural cues, other people saying hello, indirect cue, um, searching for uh, if you put a light pointer or you try to show them visually where you would like them to look or how you would like them to express hello back. Verbal cue is, did you did you hear what they said? I, want, I wonder if you should say something back. Sometimes when I hear talk to my friends, they say hello, I say hello back so they know I, I heard them and I see them. Um, visual gestural cue, waving. A direct verbal cue, they said hello to you. Not, they said hello to you, you should say hello. That's a different prompt. A direct verbal cue is still a cue, you're not giving them the answer. Um, direct point or light cue, showing them the location on the device itself, um, either making it highlighted or you can use an external thing like a wand that you can get at the dollar store that lights up or a laser pointer or whatever you can think of to visual, make that button or low te uh, cell on their low-tech device more visually appealing so they know that's what you're trying to get them to look at or indicate with. Um, and then physical assistance is obviously the highest level of cueing. And if we do physical assistance, that's things like hand over hand or even directing their elbow towards what you would like them to select. So when we are trying to grow communication, a lot of times it's not going to be that you are growing them and they're learning a new word every day and you're growing their vocabulary quickly and they they're become a whiz overnight with their communication system. Usually what you see grow first is the level of cueing you're having to give them to complete that communication exchange. So the first time I introduce my student to the music button, I'm gonna to have to do a lot of physical assistance, a lot of pointing and work to get them to activate that button. By the, you know, um, when a month goes by, I'm hoping I'm gonna to have to do less and do a lot of indirect cueing in the fact that I just put them near the music with the button in front of them and give them that wait time and they should, with very little cueing, I shouldn't have to say a whole lot, hopefully activate music and know that given the time of day it is and where they are, location next to the music box that they want music and naturally take that, um, those natural cues without having to go to the level of even direct verbal cueing. Um, but these are the kind of things that you're gonna to have to change or start thinking about how did you get them to hit the target response? And as they get more efficient with that, how can you pull back or change what you're doing to give them more of the communication responsibility? And that's kind of what I'm always thinking when I deal with any of my students is, last time they were able to express, they made a choice, when I got them to the communication page with the choices and modeled every single choice for them and gave them wait time. Next time, can they make a choice without me having to model each choice for them? Or can they get to the page themselves if I just give them a direct verbal cue or a direct point? Those are always things that you might wanna be keeping track of in your notes of what kind of cueing you're giving them and how you gave it to them so that you're aware of how you can change it in the future. Or, you know, on IEPs, they're always supposed to be have the stranger test. So if I'm a stranger coming in reading your IEP, I want to know how, if you say <laughs> Johnny can activate uh, a button to, to go to music with 80% accuracy, but you didn't put in there, <laughs> get when located next to the music button with the uh, device to the right of him for easy access and all the, the environmental things you do to get that level of success. When that stranger comes in and says, all right, here's the button. If they don't line everything else up, it will fail the stranger test. The child will not be able to perform on the same level. Um, so when you're giving detailed information in a PLEP or thinking about goals, you really wanna make sure you include what types of cueing you're doing to get your student 
to that level of um, success. So the last thing I wanna to touch on is going over core vocabulary. Core vocabulary is, refers to a small set of words that make up 70 to 90% of our vocabulary. Um, and it allows your student to express a variety of different wants and needs with a very small set of words so that they don't have to do a whole ton of navigating to quickly express themselves. So some examples are stop, go, help, more, all done pronouns, WH question words. And when you're in a classroom, saying things like, go put your backpack on the hook, go put, backpack is a fringe word, um, go put backpack on, that's a core word, hook. So you have two fringe words and the rest are core vocabulary words. And when we say core, we mainly mean the words that are going to show up on the front or on the home screen of the device. And these are not words you're going to want to program over or replace when programming because they're going to be used in a bunch of different ways with a lot of different combinations to help your student communicate um, their thoughts. So go, like, do, um, WH question words, and depending on what level you pick will be how many core words are shown up at the very front. Um, and there's a whole, I could do a whole another <laughs> screencast on how you pick which level you think your child or your student's gonna be at. Um, but for this purposes, I'm just gonna focus on what core vocabulary is. Um, core vocabulary here again, uh, this is the way Snap Core, this one is Proloquo, and this one is the Snap Core setup. And you can see here, they, they kind of color code a little differently and lay theirs out differently. Um, if I was to do a bigger grid size, you would actually see the WH questions over here prior to the pronouns, but this is pronouns, verbs, function words, articles, things like that. Um, so all within one click, you can make pretty clear sentences um, and a great example of that is I have a student who would always say, I want more, go into whatever they wanted more of. Now he can also say, can I have more? So same request, but just using just core words, he can say it in a bunch of different ways, um, turn it into a question or make a statement, those kind of things. So. Overall, I know it, obviously with this tutorial, there won't be questions, um, but these are the t techniques that I went over today. Um, modeling, wait time, recasting, level of cueing, um, and kind of how those look for your children with complex communication needs. Um, thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions, please let me know or contact um, Janice Reese. Thank you so much.